well, normally when we have a guest preacher at Shoreline, which is always a treat, and we try to get just some of the best spirit-filled, Jesus-loving communicators from around the country and the world that we can to come and speak, and usually I'm somewhere else speaking, but I like Jeff and Chris Mannion a lot. I wanted to be here to hang out with them, and I love the books that Jeff writes. I love when he preaches and teaches. I'm excited just to get to sit and hear the message again, and I think by the third time, I think I'll have it, and so I'm going to be here for all three services and just love and receiving, and also Jeff, when he comes out, he always takes time to train our board members and our leaders uh, just in different areas of leadership and growth. So he'll be doing a training tonight with about 60 or 70 of our leaders just pouring into their lives. And so I want to pray over Jeff that as he brings this message, it's, it's a message that I think God will use to invite you closer to Jesus. Our theme this whole year is more like Jesus. And to get more like Jesus, you need to be near Jesus. And he's going to invite us closer to Jesus. So will you pray with me for him as he preaches, but we also pray for yourself to receive what God wants to bring to you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we pray together for all those in the worship center, those in the family worship venue. We pray for those at home, online, different places around the world who are listening to this message. Would you draw us closer to Jesus? Would you help us see his arms open and his heart open and his welcome to each one of us? And I pray that by the end of this time, we would draw nearer to Jesus, become more like him, and be transformed. Would you anoint and fill Jeff as he brings the word? Would you prepare our hearts to receive what you have? We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Will you welcome Jeff as he brings God's word? Yeah. It is such a delight to be back at Shoreline. Uh, genuinely, for Chris and I, this is one of the highlights of our year as we've been out uh, year after year. And so pleased we get to be together today. Uh, I just want to begin by just asking a Asking for a show of hands on a couple questions. Uh, question number one, how many of you enjoy grilling? Grilling with grill, okay? Question number two, how many of you don't grill, but from time to time you're willing to eat the food of people who do grill? <laughs> okay, a few more. Uh, question number three, last question, how many of you enjoy meals within sight of the water? All right, and on Monterey Peninsula, you got more than a few options on that one, right? So today's story from the Bible that we're going to look at, someone is grilling, they're making food for others, and it is a lakeshore feast. And so we've got all of these components of food, grilling, right on the water, and the body of water that the story happens in is this picture right here, it's called the Sea of Galilee. Now, the Sea of Galilee is in northern Israel. It's not really a sea. It's more like an inland lake. It's about 33 miles around. So, I mean, you could walk around it. It'd take a couple days, but you could hoof it around the Sea of Galilee. This is where the story takes place today. There is a bed of hot coals. Uh, there's food cooking on the coals, and it is right there by the lake. This is where the story takes place. Another critical component, though, is when the story takes place. Technical term for the day, this is a post-resurrection appearance of Christ. So just say those words, post-resurrection appearance. Ready? Post-resurrection appearance. That's your heavy lifting. That, that, that's the technical term for the day, post-resurrection appearance. And what that means is this, is that uh, there's the crucifixion of Jesus, and then after the crucifixion, if, if you've ever been to church on an Easter weekend, there's often that picture of the empty tomb. Uh, people come to the tomb. He's not here anymore. He has risen. Jesus comes back to life, celebrated on Easter Sunday. And then there's this handful of stories that take place after the resurrection, these appearances after the resurrection. And these are called the... the post-resurrection appearances of Christ. Okay, who cares? It matters. Uh, later on in the story, there's a conversation that's going to take place, and knowing that this incident takes place after the resurrection is really critical to what goes down in that conversation. Now, my hope as we explore this story together and as we absorb it, my hope is that you take a serious step closer to understanding what it means to know Jesus as friend. Not simply Jesus as teacher, not simply Jesus as healer, but to know Jesus as friend. 
and our story unfolds in two parts. And part number one, let's just call it breakfast with Jesus. Part number one, breakfast with Jesus, the first of two parts. And in uh, John chapter 21, uh, verse one, the story unfolds this way. It says, after Jesus, and what's the next word? After Jesus appeared, because it's a post-resurrection appearance, after Jesus appeared again to his disciples by, and you get the place, by the Sea of Galilee, it happened this way. Peter, he's also called Simon. Sometimes they put those two together and he's called Simon Peter. He says, I'm going fishing. And six of the other disciples said, and we're going with you. Now, not fishing from shore with fishing poles, and they're not fishing from shore with nets. They're out always in their boat. They go out late in the evening, throw the net out, pull it back in. Throw the net out, pull it back in. Throw the net out. They fish the entire night, and they catch nothing. It's daybreak. The sun is just coming up. There's a guy on shore about 100 yards away, and he yells out to the boat, did you catch anything? And they yell back, no. And he says, throw the nets on the other side of the boat. Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were raised on this lake. They were not only raised on this lake, they were raised in the fishing industry on this lake. A guy on shore, throw the nets on the other side. They go, whatever. They throw the nets on the other side of the boat, and the boat lurches, and it lunges. And they try to pull this net in, and there are so many fish, they can't even get the net over the lip of the boat. And John, one of Jesus' disciples, he looks at Peter and goes, it's him. (laughs) And splash over the edge, Peter goes. Literally, he starts dog paddling to shore. While the rest of the disciples row to shore, pulling, dragging this net loaded with fish behind them. And when they arrive on shore, they see this, a fire is going, coals are burning, fish are grilling, and bread is baking. Jesus has started a fire and is cooking breakfast for them. Did you know this was in the Bible? The verse reads, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. Now Jesus says, hey, go get some of your fish too. They get some of their fish, bring them on, put them on the coals. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. Some of you love reciting some of the famous sayings of Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I have a new quote for you, come and have breakfast. Say it with me, ready? Come and have breakfast. Is there something about this that makes you want to like Jesus more? I mean, just, it's a multi-sensory experience. And disciples come up on shore, you can feel the warmth of the fire. You can hear the sizzle of the fish. You can smell the aroma of the baking bread. You can taste the meal that he's prepared, the invitation of Christ, come and have breakfast. It's breakfast with Jesus. And my heart is stirred by this story in ways I simply can't explain to you. But it might have to do with my affection for fire. A couple months ago, Christmas Day, it's a picture of my two sons and my son in law in my backyard. No snow on Christmas Day. We're grilling like half a cow on that grill. They got hot dogs in the little pan for the kids. And um, there's just something, now that's like normal for our backyard. You say, dude, Christmas Day, can't you just like go inside and open up presents like an ordinary family? Yeah, we do that too, by a fire. 
And so there's, there's something about, I say a fire, a campfire is my love language. There's just something about a fire that something comes alive in me. And so I just know as we look at this story together, there's more than a few dudes in the room that are seeing this, that Jesus built a campfire and he's grilling and you go, I now believe in Jesus. I now, I remember the day I believe, I now believe in Jesus. I believe, I believe in breakfast Jesus. I believe in campfire Jesus. Now, don't reduce Jesus to this image, but please include this in your image of Jesus. Don't reduce him to this single incident, but it, man, include this incident in who Jesus is to you. If I said, you know, okay, what did, what did Jesus do? Some of you go, okay, he healed people, and he did. Jesus had a very tender spot for people who had broken bodies and broken minds. Jesus came to be a healer. You know, that's a good start. Well, what else? Uh, a teacher. One of Jesus' titles was rabbi, which means teacher. And everywhere he goes, it seems that he's teaching. Jesus came as a healer, and he came as a teacher. Yeah, anything else Jesus did? Well, yeah, he died. And do understand the significance of what happens as he dies. When Jesus is suspended from a cross, he is willingly dying to pay off debts that weren't his. Jesus dies to pay off debts that were mine. Jesus sacrifices his life to pay off debts that were yours. He, so he's a healer and he's teacher and he's savior. Anything else? Yeah, friend. Jesus as a friend. This isn't the only meal you see Jesus enjoying with friends as you explore the life of Jesus. Some of you who are familiar with the kind of the, the cadence and the flow of the life of Christ know what his first miracle was. So someone help me here. Jesus' first miracle, we find him at a, at a wedding. Not just at a wedding, but at a wedding, at a wedding feast. At a wedding feast. It's where he turns water into wine. Jesus is camped out with some disciples at a feast, at a wedding feast. It is kind of the introduction to his miracles. Fast forward the tape, go to the last week of Jesus' life, the night that he gets betrayed, and we find Jesus and his disciples at the Last Supper. So the very beginning, you get a wedding feast. At the very end, you get the Last Supper. And particularly in Luke's gospel, the way that Luke gave us the flow of Jesus' ministry, it's like every time you turn around, Jesus is either leaving a meal, going to a meal, or sitting at a meal. Through Luke's gospel, um, Jesus, Jesus as a friend, the evenings he spent relaxing and eating and dining and talking and encouraging and challenging and befriending over food, over meals, breakfast with Jesus. They're sitting with him around a campfire, a fire that apparently he built where there's bread and there is there fish cooking. And it is my deep longing for you to know that there's a place at the table for you. In fact, if you just whisper these words to me, there's a place at the table for me. Ready? There's a place at the table for me. One more time. Ready? There's a place at the table for me. And right now, some of you guys are going, you know, Jeff, you don't, you don't, you don't know me. I, I mean, I understand why Jesus was sitting there with James and Andrew and John and Peter. I mean, we call them Saint Peter, Saint John, Saint Andrew. Jeff, I ain't no saint. I understand why Jesus would eat with them. The fact that there was a place for them at the table is one thing. I, I don't think there's a place at the table for me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm ain't a saint. And we talked about when this story occurs. We called this a post-resurrection appearance. If this is after the resurrection, it means it's also after the crucifixion. And if this is after the crucifixion, it also means it is after the trial of Jesus. Anybody sitting around the campfire that morning 
who at the trial of Jesus acted a little unsaintly? Like the guy soaking wet, the guy that jumped over the edge of the boat and swam toward shore? Are any of you familiar with what Peter did while Jesus is being interrogated? Uh, <laughs> I don't think they had talked about this yet. And they're sitting around the campfire. And they're eating bread and they're eating fish and the meal wraps up. And this is the moment where Jesus goes, uh, Peter, little something we need to talk about. Part two of the story. A fireside chat. Part two of the story. A fireside chat. Now, in uh, the, the, night, the night before Jesus is arrested, the night that Jesus is arrested, it's after the Last Supper, Jesus is with his closest disciples and he breaks the news to them. He says, listen, some dark things are gonna go down tonight. He goes, you are all gonna run. You're gonna take off you're going to bail, and you are going to leave me alone. And Peter is the one that goes, over my dead body. Look at what he says in Matthew chapter 26, verse 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I'm more dedicated. I'm more committed. I'm more devoted. I love you more than they do. Even if everybody takes off and runs, I, what, I never will. Jesus looks back at him and says, I got news. Before the rooster crows marking the beginning of tomorrow morning, you are going to disown me like three times in one night. And Peter's like, yeah, like, like that's going to happen. And Jesus is arrested, and Peter follows Jesus to the trial, to the interrogation. There's reason to believe that Peter could not only hear what was going on inside the interrogation, but that he could also, there was a sight line that he could see what was happening inside this room or second courtyard. And he's outside, camped out, and it is not going well in there. Jesus is getting ganged up on. He is outnumbered. He is getting lied about. He is getting accused. It is not going well, and Jesus doesn't seem to be defending himself. No one in that room is defending him. And Peter's in the courtyard sitting by another fire. And this is when it happens. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. And a servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him. A little later, someone else saw him and said, you, you are also one of them. Man, I am not. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Listen to his accent. He's from the north where Jesus is from. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. But as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. Now check this out. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. He breaks down and he sobs like a baby. This was not his finest moment. <laughs> there are four accounts of the life of Jesus in your Bible. Uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Do you know which one of those accounts writes about Peter disowning Jesus? All of them. This was not only massive failure, this was well-documented failure. <laughs> <laughs> this was well-publicized 
failure. This was failure that was going to get exposed, that everybody was going to come to know about. And Jesus is with Peter for breakfast by the Sea of Galilee, and they've finished their bread, and they've finished their fish, and they got a little unfinished business. And Jesus asked his friend a question. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, okay, mister, I'm more committed, I'm more devoted, I'm more dedicated. (laughs) Simon, son of John, do you really love me more than they do? Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Glad that's over with. (laughs) Then it's round two. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now, this is killing Peter. In fact, John, who's telling the story, he narrates and he says, uh, Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? I mean, you could just see him. He's crestfallen, you know. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Why? Why does Jesus drag Peter through this? Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Why does Jesus drag him through this? Three questions. And I don't think Jesus does this to shame Peter. I think that Jesus does this to restore Peter. I mean, my take on this is that during the trial, during one night, Peter had disowned Jesus three times. And I think in asking the question three times, I think that Jesus might have been giving Peter the opportunity to re-own him three times. That the denial was threefold and that the new commitment was threefold. But... uh, you know, just you know, if you were to catch up with Peter in his later years in life and say, hey, just a little question. Uh, anything in your life you wish you had kind of a do-over? <laughs> you think that night during a trial might have, might have come up? A moment of shame, a moment of disappointment, a moment of you disappointed Jesus, but you disappointed you. I've, uh, I've got a question uh, Anything in your life you wish you had a do-over? <laughs> and we can talk about Peter. That was not his finest hour. I mean, just was there a moment where you were not at your finest hour? You know, uh, it's just, if, if we just kind of went around the room and we were just kind of honest and open, we would hear all kinds of stories when people say, yeah, I, man, I so wish I had a do-over with that. Some of you would go uh, all the way back to early high school. You go back to your freshman year. And you just go, there was this girl in our class. She was socially awkward. And we made it our mission to make her life miserable day after day after day after day. You go, it just, it embarrasses me. We were mean. I was mean. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wish I had a do-over on that one. Listen, uh, what if you're overdue for a fireside chat? Some of you wouldn't look back to your freshman year in high school. You, you would look at that a season of your life or career where you had a, a, a raise and a promotion and a raise and a promotion. But you look back at that season and go, how is it that we were able to outspend 
every uptick in salary, we eclipsed by an uptick in spending. And it just wasn't the necessities. It was shiny stuff, <laughs> new stuff, a new trip, a new experience, a new thing. And you look back on that season and you just kind of go, oh my goodness, our capacity to spend money we didn't have on stuff that we didn't need. And you kind of look back with embarrassment on that season. Question, what if you're overdue for a fireside chat? And just if we went around the room and people gave their stories, there'd be more than a few that would say, dude, I was married and I, was, I got lonely and I got bored. And I found out that I could go on Facebook and look up people I used to date who were also lonely and also bored. Jeff, I'm telling you, it's a mess, it's a mess, it's a mess, and I do not know how to begin to clean it up. What if you're overdue for a fireside chat? What if in that moment, and listen, listen, not when you feel cleaned up, but when you feel messed up. What if in that moment where you just say, uh, okay, Lord, I know that you know, but I need you to know that I know. <laughs> and that was wrong, and I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. What if the words of Christ you would hear in return would be, come and have some breakfast. Come and have some breakfast. Not when you're cleaned up, but when you're messed up. What if you would hear him whisper, you don't earn your way back to me. I, I, that's why I die. That's why I gave up my life. Those sins have already been paid for. Come and have some breakfast. Feel the warmth of the fire. Uh, hear the sizzle of the fish. Take in the aroma of the fresh baking bread. Taste the meal that I prepared for you. Come and have breakfast. Okay, I go, man, dude, is that what it means to be forgiven? It's better than that. Peter doesn't simply get himself forgiven. He gets recommissioned. <laughs> he gets reassigned. It's like Jesus is saying, Peter, you need to know something. You're still on the team. You're still on the team. Now, uh, I don't know if some of you spotted the language that Jesus used. It was the language of animal husbandry. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? I mean, there's just an image here of a shepherd with sheep. When Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, oh my goodness, yeah, you know that I love you. Jesus would make three statements when he asks three times. And the three statements are these. Read them with me, will you please? Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. That is not what I expect to find in that story. I would expect Jesus to say, Peter, do you love me? And Peter goes, you know that I love you. And Jesus goes, I forgive you. And then a second time, do you love me? You know that I love you. Okay, I forgive you. A third time, do you love me? I love you. Uh, I forgive you. It's not that way. It's feed my lambs. Look, feed my lambs. Take care of my sheep. Feed my sheep. My friends, Peter is getting recommissioned. He's getting a new assignment. And what I want you to taste is this. In that moment when you're overdue for a fireside chat, and if you hear the words of Christ say, come and have breakfast, and it's just this moment where you say, I need to come to you not when I'm cleaned up, but when I feel uh, messed up. I just need to feel the warmth of a fire. Take a seat at the table or around the fireplace. Do not be surprised at all if you sense a new commissioning and a new mission upon your life. If you sense Jesus leaning in and saying, listen, I want you to know me as friend, and I would really love your help with some things. There are some people that matter deeply to me, and I would love to have your help in serving them, in encouraging them, in coaching them, in loving them as I have loved you. See, the, the beauty is this. Not only do we invite Christ into our lives, 
He invites us into his. There's something that I am about, my sheep, my flock, my sheep. And I would love to have you involved in helping me. This is so beautiful. First, simply that you're invited to the table. But then secondly, that you can feel, sense a new commissioning on your life where you might hear Christ whisper, you're still on the team, you're still on the team. Does this not cause you to want to draw near to Christ? If there's one statement I would love you to walk out with today, one image and one statement, it's just this, it's the image of a table, and it's just the expression, there's a place at the table for me. It's a table that is set and the invitation comes from Christ in just the statement, there's a place at the table for me. Can you say it with me? There's a place at the table for me. Can you whisper it again? There's a place at the table for me. One last time. There's a place at the table for me. There really is. Feel the warmth of the fire. Hear the sizzle of the fish. Smell the aroma of baking bread. Can you taste the meal that he prepares for you? There's a place at the table for you. There's a place at the table for you. Gracious God, we give thanks for this story that draws us in and that draws us near. And gracious God, I just think of uh, each brother and sister that's here today, whether near or far away. May this conversation draw us closer to your side. May we know you as, may we know you as our friend. And we ask this in the name of Jesus who came here for us. Amen. Amen. Can we thank Jeff for reading God's word today?